it's really just gonna get worse from here, I hate to say it. Most kids are willing to collaborate if you actually really take their concern into account. What do we do wrong as parents? This is the biggest parenting challenge of our generation. Dr. Stewart, what's going on? Hey, good to see you. Good uh, to good see you as well. How yeah. about you? I'm good. I'm I'm really, really good. I'm 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 really excited to have this conversation with you, especially since my 16 year old just got Snapchat three days ago. Oh so, lucky, yeah. Lucky you. I'm lucky. Yeah. But uh <laughs> but we we keep we keep things pretty tight as far as social media goes around here. But um you you definitely have this this obviously this this platform and this edge, you know, of how to how to talk to kids on social media. And it's so funny. I was, I was literally just recording a podcast right before this one. And we talked about us as parents, like this generation of parents. And, uh, you know, we are the first ones to be raising our kids in this social media environment. And we were, he and I were joking, like joking, not joking, but like, we were like, I wonder what the research is going to point to in 20 years, because like I, we, we both got the feeling that it's like, this is almost like cigarettes and Absolutely. oh, you're, yeah, your, your doctor smokes Marlboro red. So should you. And then suddenly you're like, oh wait, these are killing people. We should probably not say this, but like, I'm wondering in the next 20 years, what detrimental yes. type of data is going to come out. Cause I'm sure it's not going to be pretty. It is not going to be pretty. And uh, honestly, we already know a fair amount. So, um, you know, we, this, it's a massive social experiment that is being performed on our kids, which is frightening. We already know enough to be really worried, but it's it's really just going to get worse from here. I hate to say it. So talk to me about what what is the problem? Like, what are our problems? Well, I mean, uh, there's lots of problems. The, the, the biggest problem is that social media is built to be addictive. I mean, the, the algorithms are literally built to addict people, to have them continue coming back and back and back and back again. And, you know, the analogy you use to, uh, to cigarettes is pretty accurate because cigarette companies, as we know, they all were very well aware of what they were doing, both that they were creating something addictive and that it was harmful to people and, you know, uh, killed people. Well, what do we know about social media? It's addictive. And we also know it's harmful. Now, I, I want to be clear, Larry, like it's not that in all cases, all social media use is harmful. I mean, social media actually can be helpful for some kids, particularly kids who feel very marginalized and can uh, you know, find people to connect with, like-minded people that they share things in common with. But for the vast majority of kids, it's dangerous. And there's a very clear correlation between the amount of usage of social media and things like depression, anxiety, suicidal behavior, things like that. So the fact that, by the way, you've held out till 16 for your kid with Snapchat is a good thing. Yeah, my, my older one was 18. <laughs> Uh-huh. No, this is good. Look, yeah. I mean, it, the problem is there's so much pressure on kids and on adults to, you know, get smartphones in the, the hands of these kids so early these days, and then comes along social media. And and let's be clear, you know, the folks who are building these algorithms and who are making a lot of money off this, their interests are not in, in kids' well-being. Let's, right. let's be pretty clear about that. And, you know, even if um <laughs> You know, if you just think about like, look at the average kids, you know, feed on Instagram. I mean, it, it's like 80% commercials, right? Like it, when you and I, you know, we, we used to watch TV and, you know, it's before all the streaming services, we'd be worried about the impact of these commercials that would come on every 15, 20 minutes. These commercials are coming on every split second and tailored to exactly what they think they can sell you. So there's a, there's a ton of problems and you know, like you and I were talking about before we hopped on here, uh, this is the biggest parenting challenge of our generation, uh, hands down. And, you know, so what I want to do is I just want to help us parents figure out how to have productive conversations with our kids about it. Because, I, you know, I'm sure you've gotten the same advice every parent gets, which is like, uh, try to keep your kids away from it as much as possible and talk to your kids about it. Great. <laughs> like, how the hell do you do that? It's not so easy. And that's what we're trying to help with. So how, let me ask you, like, how, how do you do this? Because like, so I'll give you an example of what happens in my house and we're lenient with it to, to a degree, like after school. So my, my kids, the school that they go to, 
they have a zero tolerance cell phone policy. So right. when you when you walk into the classroom, this and this is brand new as of this year, you drop your cell phone in a basket and yep. that's it. You, you can check it for like a couple minutes between classes, but that's it. And if you get it, if you get caught with it in class, it's taken away for the entire day. You don't mm -hmm. get it back. Mm -hmm. So I'll even text my kids and I, I see that they have red receipts, right? And I'll text them and I can see that they actually won't even get my text to like a couple hours, right? So I know that they don't really have access to it. So when they come home um, and both of my older kids who have devices, they're, they, they come home, both of them are in extracurricular activities. My one kid is the drum major in band and then the other one's starting center for his varsity football team. So they come home, you know, they've been on all day. They're exhausted. They kind of recharge. You know, I used to, I used to watch like cartoons for 30 minutes, 45 right. minutes after school to recharge. But like, I will tell you, even though like my, I see my kids on the couch and they're going through TikTok, it infuriates me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't like it. In fact, I feel like to the point where I'm doing a disservice or failing them as a father by even allowing them to do that. And I'm sure my mom and dad, like, probably saw me watching dumb shows after school and they're like, this Not is the same thing. Right. idiotic. Right. right? So right. is there, is there like, like right when they get home from school, like, mm -hmm. is that acceptable to be like, Hey, for the next 30 minutes, you can do this. Okay. But after that, we got to, we're figuring something else out. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. I think different solutions are going to work for different kids and different families, honestly, different, you know, people have different perspectives on it. Kids have different things going on in their lives. Uh, so I think you got to customize your solutions. And for me, what that means is you got to collaborate with your kids. So it's not, it, it can't be up to us to come up with these perfect solutions and then just sort of dictate them to our kids. That never really works that well, to be honest, especially with a complicated problem like this. And you can bet your bottom dollar, if you restrict total access to these things, your kids are going to, they're going to find access to them in other places at other times. And it's like anything else in the world. The more you try to keep your kids away from it, the more they're drawn to it. So, you know, you got to work together with your kids to come up with solutions. And what I hear you saying, Larry, is like, when you try to put yourself in their shoes, you can see why they want to use these things to decompress, be on TikTok for a little bit after a stressful day before they hop into all kinds of other things. You get that. And at the same time, you're a little worried about what they're using to decompress. And you're probably also thinking to yourself, this stuff is also addictive. So it's a little harder to, you know, you you watched a, you know, a dumb cartoon. It was over in a half an hour. And you sure, sure the next one might come on, but there was an <laughs> there was an endpoint. There's no endpoint, you know, uh to scrolling. So it's got to be a self-imposed endpoint. So the whole point here is I think you got to collaborate with your kids and Everything I'm hearing from you so far, it says you're going to do a very good job at it because instead of you just coming out with, here's what I think needs to happen, you're thinking a lot about what's going on for your kids and what about this, why they might be interested in this, because that's what you got to get to the bottom of first. You got to get their perspective on the table, their concerns, what's going on for them before you share yours, which are your worries, you, you know, things like that. And then you're going to invite them to the table to collaborate. And that's going to be the most effective way to go about this, especially because, you know, 16 year old, 18 year old, like you only got them in your house a little while longer before then they're out on their own without you to say, you can't do that. And I'm taking that away. They got to manage it entirely themselves. They have to develop the skills to be able to do that. So I think it's really around helping them develop the skills around this, right? You got it. Yeah. So. You mentioned in there being very, very collaborative. And I want to talk about that. Like, hey, like, let's, like, I'm sitting here thinking, like, if I were to have a conversation around, like, hey, what do you think some of the issues are of you being on this app too long? They might be like, well, nothing. But, you know, I'm sure there's more to it. But I, I want to talk about, well, like, so, some... sorry, Larry, can I interrupt though? Because that was a leading question that already closed the door. Because you said, well, it, let me hear about what your thoughts are about it be you being on it too long. So you were already saying, you're on it too long. Let me hear your thoughts about that. Fair. I'd recommend much more open-minded, just be like open-ended here. Just be like, hey, you know, when you get home from school, it seems like uh, you really just want to scroll on TikTok. Fill me in. What's the deal? Like I could make an assumption about why that is, but I'm, I'm curious. What's up? What and do you think that would, 
Like what, what do you, what do you, what's the most common thing that parents hear when they ask that question? Uh, in the case that you're talking about right after school, it's something like, I just want to chill. Just want to chill. Like, yeah. I want to chill. I just want to zone out a little. Now, what I would say to you is most of us with parents, we're too quick to say, oh, I got it. You just want to chill. But here's the thing and move on to our concerns. And what I always tell parents is, you know, this whole idea of how to talk to your kids about social media, honestly, it's more how to listen to your kids. So ask them a ton of questions. If you're not getting much back from them, take some guesses. And anytime they say anything to you, sort of reflect back to you, to them what you're hearing from them and just try to be a detective. Just try to gather information. Just listen. And by the way, if you listen to them, they're going to be a whole lot more likely to listen to you as well. So if they say to me, I just want to chill, what I'd say is, got it. So you just want to chill. That's a little of what we call reflective listening. So um, why do you think it's so important to chill right then? And I'm not saying you can't, I'm just curious, like what's going on for you when you're chilling like that? And then I'd be asking questions like, and is TikTok like, um, does that help you chill more than other things? Like other things on your phone or things not on your phone? And you're going to learn a lot. And one of the things that I find fascinating is if you listen to your kids real well, you'll find kids share most of our concerns about social media. They are not, when you get down to it, they're not like, oh, this thing's great. I love it. There's no problems whatsoever with this. Um, you, you parents are totally out, out of touch. No, they'll be the first to tell you, oh yeah, it's really hard to stop. And sometimes I scroll for 25 minutes and I'm like, what the hell did I just spend my time on? Like that was a total waste. Other kids will tell me they actually start off feeling like they're chilling, but then they actually feel worse. Other kids will tell me they're actually able to chill successfully by watching funny videos and things and shutting it off. It depends on the kid, but you really got to work hard to gather information. That's your first goal. So, okay. Got that. Let's go back and just back up to some of the, yeah. the known detriments of this. So like, what is it that we don't know as parents, what's, what's happening to our kids with social media? Well, uh, you know, uh, one of the things we don't know is that it, there's a correlation, right, between social media use and some of the things that I was describing before, like depression, anxiety, things like that. Now, we have a phrase in, in research, we say correlation does not mean causation. That's just a fancy way of saying we're not sure which is cart and which is horse entirely. So is it that when you're depressed and anxious, you tend to stay on these things more often or being on these things causes depression and anxiety. And that's hard to disentangle. And we don't, we won't know that for quite some time, honestly. And even it's, it's hard even over time to do it because what you need is a bunch of kids um, who don't use social media at all and a bunch that do, and you have to randomly assign them to those conditions. Very hard to do. So there's a lot of unknowns about exactly how this all works, but it is undisputable that um, kids who spend a lot more time on social media ha are much much greater risk mental health wise. That correlation is clear. I can see that. Um, and can I add a couple other things, Larry? Like, please. We also, you know, uh, algorithms that are meant to addict like this. I mean, you, you probably see this. I mean, I'm sure you know you're on some form of social media yourself, right? Like, whether it's Twitter or whatever, like you're staring at things for like a second or two before you're deciding interested, not interested, right? And if you're interested, how long are you interested for, right? It's like 20 seconds or something like this. One thing that remains to be seen is what is this doing to our brains when it comes to our ability to focus deeply on something? Uh, you know, as a dad and myself of three, one of the things I get worried about with not only my kids, but myself and all of us is our ability to just be present, to just have a conversation, you know, because the second you feel sort of bored or something like that, oh man, is it really easy to grab your phone, right? And how often are you talking to somebody, kid or adult, where you're only half talking to them because the other half of them is sending a text, checking something, things like that. To me, that kind of stuff is infuriating. We don't know the impact of that in the long term. Are we less able to sit and just have a conversation like we're having now? The thing that drives me crazy too is when I see these teenagers out at a workplace, like or a place where like I'm, you know, like whether it's at the gym or wherever else, and you got a question and the person behind the desk is on a phone and they literally like won't even look up at you and you're just standing there like, when this person, when is this person yes. going to help me? Like it, yes. it just drives me crazy. 
Well, and look, you know, as a clinical psychologist, one of the things we know is that our human brains best develop in what we call a relational context, where like humans really relate to each other, look at each other, talk to each other, respond to each other. And when we're so disconnected, it's not good for brain development uh, at all. So, you know, this is, these are the kind of things we know, but we're, we don't have enough data yet hasn't happened long enough. You know, we need decades to really study this stuff well, but I'm with you. That drives me nuts. I could give you a list of 50 things that drive me nuts. <laughs> I'm sure I, I can't, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. Um, talk to me about um, what, what do we, what do we do wrong as parents? I, I have a feeling you're, you're, you're going to go down. I think the, the path I think you're going to go down, which is we try to make this around blame and pain and guilt. And it's a really negative conversation, probably how it lands for our teenagers. And I love how you, you talk more about like asking more questions and just getting very, very curious. But at, at the end of the day, like how do we come to an agreement of how we're going to operate within these cell phones? Yeah. Um, well, and there's different questions. There's how do you come to an agreement like within a family and then sort of larger groups like your your kid's school? You know, that's a large group of people. How do you come to an agreement right. there? Well, the adults basically decide it's going to be too hard to come to an agreement involving the kids. So we're just going to make this decision because we think these things are dangerous and getting in the way of learning, which is absolutely yeah. accurate. And they're doing the right thing, right? To get them out of school as much as possible. But in terms of one family at a time, you know, as I alluded to earlier, you can come up with customized solutions that are mutually satisfactory. So I bet if you sat down, and I'm not saying it's going to have one magic conversation, but it might be a few conversations with your son about his coming home and wanting some time to chill, if that's really what his perspective is, and you feeling like, God, this is stupid what he's looking at. It's a waste of time on TikTok. I bet that you guys could come up with some solutions where he would be able to chill in a way that wouldn't necessarily run the risks that you're worried about with whatever he's looking at. Um, I think you can get there. I think you can get to what we call mutually satisfactory solutions to problems. And I know this because we've been doing this for years with things other than social media, and frankly, um, in a lot tougher settings than our homes. And we do this in, in, in prisons, you know, correctional facilities, in therapeutic facilities with severely traumatized kids, adults and kids, can work together to come up with mutually satisfactory solutions. This is just the, the the biggest problem in our parenting worlds these days that we need to apply that kind of logic to. Got it. Okay. And, wow. and but you asked me. You can tell I go on too long here. You asked me about uh, the biggest mistake. Um, I think we we spend too much time thinking about what we're going to say to our kids. Uh, you know, how to talk to, as I mentioned before, I would sort of rebrand this whole thing is not how to talk to your kids about social media, how to listen to your kids. We don't listen well enough to our kids. You know, we, uh, it all starts with empathy and empathy doesn't mean agreeing or disagreeing with your kid. It simply means trying to understand where they're coming from. And you can understand somebody, even if you don't sort of share their per same perspective, which is something we're really bad at right now in the world, to be honest. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us parents to teach our kids to do that. So I think the biggest mistake we make is too much talking, not enough listening. And the second biggest mistake we make is when things are not going the way we want, the solution's not addressing our concerns, we go back to tried and true parenting, which is basically using consequences or rewards to try to change our kids' behavior. And what that really is about is basically saying, hey, we're going to leverage the power differential we have here. Because at the end of the day, we're more powerful than you. We're going to leverage that power differential and solve the problem the way I want it solved, which doesn't create durable solutions, doesn't help you um, understand your kid, and doesn't help your kid get good at problem solving with other humans out there unless they have the power, which is a big problem in our world, in my view. Uh, that, makes, that makes total sense. Um... Very interesting. Um, so when it comes to like, so like, for instance, we have, we use a, a platform in our, in our family called RO, which is like this, it's this genius company that came up with this really cool app of it measures your time away from your phone completely. And it like, 
gamifies it and makes it really interesting and, you know, gives you dopamine hits when you hit certain milestones and that kind of thing. So it's really ingenious. Um, the thing that I have found really, really interesting about this world of, of social media is the fact that like, so for instance, we allow our kids to, our, our little guys are 10 and eight year old to play video games. And we didn't do this with our older ones, but we're, we're experimenting. And I use that term very, very strongly. We're experimenting with it just to see what it's like. Mm -hmm. So we're allowing, you know, our, our, my 10 year old in particular to play like, you know, online games with some of his buddies from school. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is, is, and, and I should have listened to every single podcast guest that came on and talked about this but it's like a crowbar trying to get him away from video games more so than my older ones. Because one thing that is interesting about that dynamic is that's now like part of their social community, which yeah. is really, really infuriating to me. So like if I take, you know, video games like out of the mix away from the kids or like I, so, or like, so, you know, we put a limit on it, right. His, his buddies, his three buddies don't have limits on, on yes. the games. Like they can play whatever they want. And my son is always coming. He's like, dad, he's like, he's like, why can't I play as long as so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so? -and -so? He's like, do you realize they make fun of me because I have to get off the video game? And then they start talking about like what they did in the video game the next day at lunch. Yep. And I'm sitting there and I have no clue what they're talking about. And he's like, I don't really feel like I'm part of it. And I'm sitting here thinking like, God bless. This is complicated. Like yep. before us growing up like me and you right we had to be in the same room playing nintendo like we couldn't yeah. and that was our community we had to physically be present so how do we tackle that one that one's hard man yeah now you're right it is really complicated and you know at the same time i say to myself all right but let's look at an earlier example that bears a little similarity is like if you were the kid whose parent insisted you were home early for dinner and then in the house and not outside anymore or on the phone or anything like that, they were basically trying to sort of put some limits on your interactions. You know, this is just the modern day technological version of that. Instead of you got to come home at seven for dinner and you're, you're staying in now it's, you know, whether you're going to be allowed back out into the social world when it comes to playing games with your friend. Now, but this example is so perfect. Because if you just set a limit on this, you are completely missing your kid's very valid perspective. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying, oh, so, oh, it's social, no limits. No, 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 no. But you're going to want a solution here that takes into account his very valid point of view here, right? I mean, he's missing out on a lot. People are making fun of him, things like that. A, so, a solution you all, come, you all come up with is going to have to take that into account. Now, that may be a compromise of some sort, or, you know, it may be you thinking out loud with him about, all right, well, so how can we not have your whole existence consumed by this and still have you feel like a part of things? Like, what could that look like? It doesn't have to look like it does now. We could come up with a new system. But for me, it's got to respect my concerns as well. You don't want to make sure you're not missing out on things. You want to make sure people aren't making fun of you. I'm worried about you being only on these games for hours on end. And I would ask you to be a, bit, a little bit more specific with him about why that is. Is it you're worried about him, you know, not doing his homework, not having a, a chance to hang out with family? Is it you're not you're worried about him not being out doing things physically, whatever it might be. But you got to put those on the table so that you guys can hash this out together. I mean, that is what I'm concerned about. You know, I want him I want him outside. I want him exercising i want him doing other things besides being wanting to be in front of this video game because like i mean don't get me wrong he'll listen right if i'd be like hey you got to get off he'll be like all right that's mm -hmm. and he'll have the attitude of like that really sucks but okay um but the other thing too is that um you know i i guess for me is like he, here's the other thing too like they always the kids who are on digital devices, even if something is quote unquote exciting, they view it as boring. I'm sure you haven't heard that one. 
Tell me so, more. Yeah. I mean, so like for instance, um, and, and I've, I've done enough of these podcasts now, like, and I've talked to enough experts that my response when they're like, I'm bored, I'm like, oh man, like, yeah, it sounds, sounds like a great opportunity to do something creative, <laughs> you know? I mean, but I, I think that their brains are so wired to consume and not produce, you know, like my, my eight-year-old, he's not a big video gamer mm -hmm. and we, we really, really encourage him to do other things besides play video games. And he's got like this crazy imagination my there's an entire right now corner of my basement that is stacked from floor to ceiling with random boxes because he made a fort That's and it awesome. is a it's a total mess down there and my and i was just like i love this i love the fact <laughs> that he just threw it is a mess it is stuff everywhere like cut up pieces of cardboard everywhere my wife is like oh my god when can we clean this up i was like not for a while I'll just let him play with it but um you know, he, he just goes and he just plays and it's great. Yeah. But like, I've noticed the more video games that come on board, like we just did a family reunion this past weekend and all the kids, cousins who are big into screens, they were like, it was like torture. Mm -hmm. They were like, there's no Wi-Fi. Like, uh -huh. what am I supposed to do? And we're like, uh, there's so many play that you can fish. You can, there's so many play areas here. You like, you can go on the swing set. Like there's all kinds of so many things you could do. But like the the view is if I don't have a screen, I'm bored. Like, how do we fight that one as parents? Yeah, well, and and this is another big one because it is pretty alarming that sort of free play, if you will, yeah, uh, has really gotten sort of squeezed out of kids' lives. And social media is not, uh, you know, and gaming and things. That's not the only uh, reason to, to, you know, that that's happened. So blame is it can be placed elsewhere as well. But that's really concerning because I was talking about healthy brain development. Play is a huge part of that, okay? Play is really facilitative for development. In other words, play is how you learn to develop all kinds of skills. So your question is, how do you do, how do you deal with that? Well, this is where I was saying, you know, before, if you take that conversation with your, your kid who's, uh, you know, wanting to connect more and doesn't want to feel like the loser who, you know, has to get off the game and people are making fun of him because he, you know, he couldn't keep playing. Well, um, he wants to connect with his friends. Your concern might be around, all right, I'm cool with you connecting with friends. My concern is if it's just gaming, it's not like you're not like having to use your brain in a whole bunch of interesting ways. You know, you're not having to get creative. Um are there any ways that you could connect with your friends that might be a bit more creative? And by the way, maybe it's even online, but it might be a little bit more creative. What do you think? So again, I'm coming back to the same thing. Kids got to be co-author of the problem solving because any solution you or I come up with and just hand down to our kids, you know, it, it's really not going to sort of stick if it doesn't address their concerns as well. So let's take this back from little kid then to teenager. Yeah. Like if I wanted to go have a conversation around my, my teenager, what have you found that is most common that they come up with? So like I could see myself going to my 16 year old cause I know he wants to watch TikTok, and that's kind of like how he decompresses. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, you know, Hey, can you think of a different activity that would help you decompress? And he'd be like, no, mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, can we think of something? No, I don't know. I don't know. Like that's, that's probably what I would get. Yeah, that's and fine. So how do you, how do you have that conversation if they're not willing to budge on like, yeah, I wouldn't even call that not willing to budge. I mean, first of all, one of the things that we, we hope uh, kids haven't lost the skill to do is, is generate solutions to a problem. And just because a kid immediately says, yeah, I don't know, that doesn't mean you, we don't let them off the hook that easy. I mean, that means he thought about it for half of a second, a complicated problem. So my response usually when a kid says, I don't know is, oh, hold on a second, think about it for a sec. OK, this is a tough problem. We might have to do some thinking together. So what we're trying to come up with is ways for you to decompress that may not always have to be on social media. Give it a little thought. We'll just just let me give you like 30 seconds and and literally bite your tongue and count to 30, Larry. It'll feel like an eternity like forever. Yeah. If you can even get there that long and you'll be surprised. Sometimes they'll come up with things. And if they don't, you know what I would say to you? I would say to you, you got another problem besides social media here. Your kids' problem solving skills need some help. There's not a lot. Of, maybe we need to practice this more. So what do you do then? As a parent, what you do is you say, all right, well, let me see if I can come up with an idea. And I'm not going to be the one to choose it. We got to do it together. But we'll try it on for size together. 
And the way I suggest doing this, whether it's your kid's idea or your idea, either way, trying it on for size is basically you saying, do you think that would work for you? Because I, you know, I want to make sure it's something that's really going to feel like you're decompressing. And is it something that's going to work for me? Because I told you the reasons that I'm not so wild about TikTok. And is it doable? Is it like realistic? Okay. And so if they don't have any ideas, you can tentatively suggest one. And don't be worried when you're like, well, like, uh, how about we go outside and shoot some hoops? And if they're like, I don't want to shoot hoops and I don't want to shoot hoops with you. Don't take the bait. Be like, all right. Sounds like that. I didn't work so great. What is it about that? I'm not saying we have to do that. Just fill me in. Why doesn't that one work so great? And let's see if we can come up with some others. So part of this is hanging in there to practice. You know, if you want your kid to develop these skills, it, they don't develop it in one conversation. It's practice and repetition. Have you ever found that most parents are like, okay, well, until you come up with another idea, you have to give the phone to me. <laughs> yeah. I find that all the Cause time. I, Cause I could just see them like wanting to just like bypass the question. Yeah. I'll think about it. And they'll just keep going. Yeah. So do you, yeah. do you then well, implement yeah. like a consequence? No, no. I'm just laughing. Cause it's funny. Like we parents, we cannot get away from yeah. trying to impose our will. We're like, right. so even when we're trying to collaborate, we're like, if you don't collaborate with me, I'm going to impose my will. And right. then what you get is a kid who's like trying to collaborate with a, a hand tied behind their back. So no, you know, if, if it's not going so great, you, you troubleshoot the process. I mean, uh, look, at the end of the day, I always tell parents, and whether it's social media or any other problem you've got, you only got three options. And actually, in my work, I call these your three plans. We call it plan A when you try to impose your will to make your kid do what you want them to do. We call it plan B when you try to collaborate with a kid. And we call it plan C when you decide to sort of drop it or, or solve it the way they want it solved. Those are your only three options, okay? And it, what I tell parents, don't try to mix them up, though. <laughs> don't try to sort of say, hey, let's collaborate. Let's do this collaborative problem solving thing. But if you don't collaborate with me, I'm going plan A on you and imposing your my will. Uh, that's not a, sort of a, a good context for, for collaborative problem solving. So actually making it consequential, if you don't collaborate, then it's my way. I, I mean, that I, to me, I, I don't know. Would you want to be a part of a collaboration where somebody's saying you let's collaborate, but if, if it doesn't work out the way I want, then I'm going to impose my will? No, you, you want it to be true collaboration, which is you got stuff you care about, you're worried about, you're concerned about, you got a perspective. I do too. Let me work really hard to understand where you're coming from. Let me be as curious as possible. And then I want you to try to listen to where I'm coming from. And then let's put our heads together because I think we can come up with some win-win solutions. Can, can I ask a question that it might sound offensive, but I'm just genuinely curious about it. Yeah, of course. Because I can see, because I've seen this, you know, I've been podcasting in the parenting space for 10 years. And when, so, when I see this type of approach, like I see the old, old school parents come out of the woodwork and say, um, you're the parent, like for the love of God, lay down the law and just say, if you don't come up with an idea, then we're going with this one. You're the kid. I'm the parent. This is my house, my rules. This yeah. is it. I'm giving you an opportunity to be collaborative. And if you're not, then this is the way it goes. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Versus like, you know, this whole thing of like, and, and I'm, I'm confused with this myself because mm -hmm. I, I don't know child psychology and we were all raised sort of similar, like my way or the highway type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, it to some, I'm not trying to globalize everybody, but we were raised like me and you, our generation, I think we were raised a bit tougher, right? Like a little bit more iron fist. And I don't necessarily think that that's a great approach either, but I also think, you know, giving a kid way too much leeway might be detrimental too, to the point of like, yeah. And if you don't make a decision and keep paying the, or, or if you keep putting this off, it's going to be this. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Like, so so look, uh, you know, the part of the reason I introduced that you got three options there, if you're trying right. to collaborate with your kid and you're stuck, you know, time doesn't stand still. So you got to do something in the meantime. And what I always say to people is, you know, if you only got, got three options and you're stuck in the mud collaborating, well, in the meantime, you got two other choices. One is impose your will and the other is handle it the way the kid wants it handled for now while you keep trying to collaborate. And I say to myself, you know, it's not really for me to decide. It's for you. I would say to you, Larry, well, depends what you care more about. Because 
you can go plan A and impose your will, and then your expectation will get met. And, you know, they won't be on TikTok, okay? They won't practice many skills. <laughs> they, uh, you know, the, the relationship might take a hit temporarily, but they're not on TikTok. Or you could decide to use plan C, and you know what? They're still on TikTok, so your concerns are not being addressed, um, but they're maybe not all pissed off at you. Depends what you're trying to accomplish, okay? I want to be clear. I wholeheartedly agree that as parents, we need to decide sort of where the limit is. And if you can't come to a good solution collaboratively with your kid, you may decide to take it away because you think that it's too dangerous. It's too, you know, it's too damaging. The impact is too bad. Absolutely. That's what we as parents need to do. But I would resist the temptation to say to a kid, if you're not willing to collaborate, because in my view, most kids are willing to collaborate if you actually really take their concern into account. It's just in their experience, us parents collaborating with them isn't real collaboration. It's let's collaborate to make sure our concerns get addressed and yours are nowhere to be found. And so this is what I teach is collaboration is really about two sets of concerns on the table. And if this works in, in correctional facilities, as we have shown it to, I know it can work in the average home, even with a complicated problem like social media. So to talk to me about like just some of the concerns that kids have brought up about social media. I, I'd be really curious to know what's bouncing around in their mind. Yeah, but this is the thing that I, I love about these collaborative conversations because oftentimes as parents, we're like, all right, this is going to be tough, right? Because we, we do not see eye to eye here. And if you really listen to your kids, you, you'll be shocked. Because they're going to say the very same things, many of the very same, not entirely, but many of the very same things. And if they do, like if you hear they share your concerns, you know what's cool? You then are collaborating instead of working like against your kid, you're not working with them. What you're working against is those addictive algorithms because the ki kids will tell you, yeah, you know what? Um, I, I just like, I don't like how it just is a time suck. And like, you know, I, I like to chill, but like all of a sudden, all this is time is gone. And like, I don't necessarily feel more relaxed. In fact, I feel a little stressed because now this time's gone by and I haven't done anything. And sometimes it just makes me feel bad because I see a bunch of things that, you know, everybody's showing off how great their life is and stuff like that. You hear girls, by the way, constantly talk. You ask girls, teenage girls to talk to you about social media. My goodness, will they tell you about all the pressures when it comes to body image and things like that? So our kids do not have their heads in the sand here at all about this. So they will tell us my experience. They're telling me the same things that we as parents are concerned about. And then they even talk about um, some other things that I don't think we really have a great window into, which is about just how damaging it can be socially to them or people they know who get really ostracized as well in sort of really harmful ways. So this is, again, just the reason we want to get our kids talking as much as possible and trying to understand where they're coming from. Wow. Okay. And then, um, so basically it's, it's getting the agreement on some of the problems, right? Getting the agreement and the collaboration on the actual issues. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, not so. So what you want to do is you want to try to um, understand each other's perspectives or concerns, and you're collaborating around those. You don't want to be like, well, here's your solution and here's mine. How are we going to sort of meet in the middle? Uh, that is bad problem solving. OK, instead of like having dueling solutions on the table, you want to spend your time doing some detective work to try to understand, you know, sort of how they see the problem, what their perspective is and what they're worried about. And then you'll share yours as well. And they don't have to be the same. They can be different, but you're going to find a lot of overlap. That, that makes total sense. Um, wow. Okay. Um, can, I, sorry, you, can I add one other thing, Larry? Yeah. You know, uh, just a piece of advice for us parents. Also, don't try to solve social media or, you know, even TikTok or, you know, it's, it's too big. Like take, break it down. And so, you know, I have parents list like all the things they're worried about and sort of when they happen and stuff. And I say to them, let's take on one at a time. Like your example of your kid who doesn't have access to his phone at all. So then when he gets access to his phone, he sort of, it goes right to it to, to chill after school. Like that's carving out a highly specific example of social media and your concerns around it. 
Uh, for other parents, it's like, I can't get him to school on time because he's on his phone immediately, or he's up too late at night, um, or he's not getting his homework done. Like try to dial in more uh, on a specific aspect of the problem because the problem solving is going to go a whole lot better then. Okay. Interesting. Okay. What, and what do you think is an optimal, um, like what's an option, optimal amount of time to spend on social media? Well, so this is, the, you know, it, it depends on age entirely and think places like the American Academy of Pediatrics and other places have given guidelines by age. Uh, you know, the thing I say to people again, though, it, it, it entirely depends on people's circumstances, right? Uh, you know, uh, some kids are much more vulnerable than others. Some kids are using social media for much more sort of productive and healthy ways to connect than others. So I don't think there is one right answer to that question. Uh, do, I mean, do I think anybody should be on social media for seven hours a day? No, uh, but it should be a half an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours. Uh, it really depends on kid family situation. Okay. That, that makes sense. Is there, what about, what about like an age range? Like or that kind of thing? Like are there are certain ages that are associated with um, the amount of social media or like, I, I mean like, or even access to it. Like what yeah. do people, what do people yeah, the recommend? The bottom line is, uh, and this is sort of uh, obvious uh, advice, but the research backs it up. The longer you can wait, the better, the better. Yeah. I've heard that. And, you know, look, a lot of this is about, um, you know, us humans trying to resist urges and control impulses. And you know how as an adult at, at my age, at your age, that's hard to do with social media. But Very much. Uh, a 16 year old brain is going to have a much easier time managing it than a 10 year old brain. Um, so the, you know, the, the later you can hold off, the better. Um, and this is where, you know, there are parenting groups, for instance, that are working really hard to advocate for whole communities to sort of decide together, we're going to hold off to a certain age. Because as long, you know, as soon as some parents start doing it early on, it puts a tremendous pressure on other parents to to do the same. And then it's, uh, you know, it's an upstream battle. I can see that. I can definitely see that. Um, what What type of resources do you have available to help, you know, yeah. just parents with this? Yeah, so I've been uh, really fortunate to uh, collaborate, speaking of collaboration, with a local foundation here, the Shaw Family Foundation, who's very concerned about this problem. And uh, together, uh, we've created some resources, but th they have a, this website's called uh, Your Brain on Social Media, and it's yourbrainonsocialmedia.org. And my God, Larry, there are so many resources there for us parents. Like you want to understand the research, what it really says, it's there in black and white. And you can sort of get the high level or you can drill down and get much more information. So uh, you, you want to tackle uh, subjects like when should I allow my kid to have a phone or access to uh, you know, to social media and particularly which forms of social media. It's all on there. And then the part that um, I want to draw particular attention to is the part of how to talk to your kids about social media. And what you'll find there is we've got a whole video series that walks people through the steps for doing this. And you're not going to be surprised. The first step, empathy, listening hard, being curious, asking a lot of questions, getting your kid's perspective on the table then sharing yours and then inviting them to collaborate. But there are a whole bunch of uh, resources to help troubleshoot the process on there as well. So I really encourage people to check it out. Your social, uh, your brain on social media.org. Your brain on social media.org. That remind you know what that reminds me of, right? Of course. That's why we came up yeah. with that. <laughs> you, you, you remember what I'm talking about, right? Of course. That's yeah. where it comes from. Yeah. That was from, I, I remember the fried egg. Like, you got it. Yeah, man. Oh my gosh. That's so crazy. <laughs> well, so yeah. that's where the name comes from. Cause anybody of our generation who, you know, we are the parents who are confronting this dilemma. You remember that you remember the fried egg, you remember you your brain on drugs. And this is a different kind of drug. Uh, but this is the drug that perhaps we as parents are uh, most globally concerned about right now. What do you think just as we wrap up here? Cause I, I am curious about this. Like, <laughs> I remember like, I remember being a kid and, you know, they, they talked about like, this is your brain and this is your brain on drugs, but they weren't really like, 
you know, the internet wasn't around yet. They weren't really talking about like, what are the actual, like really bad detrimental effects of this? We don't really know yet that kind of thing. And then it kind of all came out, but like, what are we seeing besides depression, anxiety, that kind of thing? I, I'm, I'm just curious, like, do you have like just stats in general that, that give us, you know, more, more, more of a clear picture of what this is doing to our kids' brains? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's where I would say go right to your brain on social media because you'll see all of the high level stats there. Now, in terms of you're also sort of curious about like, all right, you know, really what's happening in the brain and how is this impacting that? You know, this is where research is really just getting going to know, you know, if a kid is spending six hours a day on social media, how is that actually impacting their brain at a neuronal level? Like actually when it comes down to neuronal connections in the brain, we're going to learn so much about that um, in the next decade. Uh, but for, you know, at, at present, I'd be most concerned about the high level impacts that are the fallout of that. You know, um, yeah. And again, uh, go right to the website, ton of data for you there. Got it. Okay. Well, guys, not to worry. We're going to have all the links in the show notes for you. If you head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday one seven six for the show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash one seven six for the show. This is, uh, this has been really, really enlightening. Um, and, and I know that this is a huge problem and I, and I think a lot of us parents, uh, we, we tend to take like more of this back burner approach to this topic because it's almost like, I don't want to fight that battle. The battle is too big. I, I know the consequences are big, but I'm not really sure what the consequences are yet. Cause they're not really like out there, out there, but they're kind of out there, but this is really, really great. You're doing some really groundbreaking work here. And, um, I could foresee this being just such a tremendous resource for us. So thank you for doing the work you're doing. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me on here and to call an attention to this. And, and you, you said it so well there, right? I mean, we, as parents, we're like, we're worried, right? But we don't know what to do. And it seems like, you know, there's not much we can do in the face of sort of the onslaught here. But the one clear thing you can do immediately you start talking to your kids about this and listening to their perspective and letting their them hear what you're worried about and, and trying to actually work together on it. So that's the one piece of clear advice. And even if it doesn't go well, it's not going to cause harm. OK, so um, I hope those resources are helpful for people. I, I really appreciate you having me on and uh, keep up your uh, your great work supporting dads like you and, and me and every, everyone else who's uh, just doing our best. Uh, I like to say people do well if they can. Uh, dads, we do well if we can. We're doing the best we can to handle some complicated stuff. So true. Very, very true. Well, I appreciate you coming on. This was awesome. Thank you so much again. Like I said, guys, head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday 176 for the show. Grab the show notes, grab the links, go check out what Dr. Stewart is doing in the world. Go have better conversations with your kids, collaborative conversations around this. We are the front line when it comes to this battle. Uh, don't forget that guys. And, and we can do this better. So thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. Pleasure. Great to meet you. Thanks for having me. You as well.